Hey there, it's Dr. Peebler again for another episode of Cancer is a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. In this episode, we are going to dive pretty deep into cell bioenergetics and some cell biology and biochemistry associated with cancer. In the last episode, we talked very briefly about something called the Warburg effect. And in this, this video, we're going to start to dive into what the Warburg effect is how it is driving cancer and how cancer is driving it. Okay, so let's go to this paper in Metabolites in 2021. Chief author is Thomas Seafried, Dr. Seafried up at Boston College. Can the mitochondrial metabolic theory explain better the origin and management of cancer than the somatic mutation theory? And what it says is a theory that can best explain the facts of a phenomenon is more likely to advance knowledge than a theory that is less able to explain the facts. As we talked about in the previous videos, cancer is generally considered a genetic disease based off the somatic mutation theory, where mutations cause dysregulated cell growth. However, we talked about last time that evidence is showing that the mitochondrial metabolic theory can better account for the hallmarks of cancer, the hallmarks that we talked about several videos ago, than the somatic mutation theory. The highlighted portion talks about proliferating cells, can cells that are that are that are growing cannot survive or grow without carbons and nitrogen for the synthesis of metabolites and ATP. And ATP is also known as adenosine triphosphate. It's the energy currency of life. It's something we're going to be talking about quite a bit more in the future when we start diving into mitochondrial function. But just know that. Cancer cannot survive, just like any other cells can't survive, without the nitrogen, the carbon, in order to make metabolites and ATP. Glucose carbons are essential for metabolite synthesis through the glycolysis and pentose phosphate pathways, while glutamine, nitrogen, and carbons are essentially for the synthesis of nitrogen-containing metabolites and ATP through the glutaminolysis pathway. Glutamine-dependent mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation becomes an essential ATP synthesis and cancer cells that overexpress the glycotic pyruvate kinase M2 isoform, PKM2, that have deficient oxphos and can grow in either hypoxia, low oxygen, or in cyanide. The simultaneous targeting of glucose and glutamine while elevating levels of non-fermentable ketone bodies offer a simple and parsimonious therapeutic strategy for managing cancer. Now, that was a mouthful. What is it got? What 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 exactly is it saying? Is we're gonna we're gonna explain it in detail, okay? But just for now, just keep this on the back burner of what we just talked about: how cancer cells need glucose and glutamine in order to make basically the energy currency of life, ATP, and all the other metabolites necessary for growing cancer cells. In the next slide, we're gonna talk about how ATP, the energy currency of life, normally is made substantially, and the majority is made inside the mitochondria. And we're going to talk about these pathways. So, and, and it's going to be a recurrent theme. So don't worry if you don't get it the first time. Okay. If we look at this graph, the majority of the ATP production, more than 88% is from the mitochondria in a normal cell. However, you can see that that starts to plummet as we go towards malignancy or cancer. Okay. Cancer, however, goes from 12% in a normal cell of SLP, substrate level phosphorylation. Don't worry about what it means yet. We're going to explain it. But it's a different a different way of making energy in the cells. And it starts to become the dominant way that energy is produced in the cell of a cancer cell. And as you can see, this is a normal mitochondria, electron micrograph. And this is what a cancer mitochondria look like. So you can tell, obviously, they're not, they're not the same. We're going to explain later in the series what these are here and what is not present here and why that's extremely important, but that's not, that's for another time. So what this says is various abnormalities in mitochondrial structure and function prevent maximal ATP synthesis through oxphos, oxidative phosphorylation, and cancer cells. Little ATP synthesis would occur through the glycolysis in cancer cells that express the dimeric form of pyruvate kinase M2, mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation, and the glutamine-driven glutamine analysis pathway substantiated by the succinyl-CoA ligase reaction in the TCA cycle can partially compensate for the reduced ATP synthesis through both oxphos and glycolysis. Again, I understand these are mouthfuls. Unless you're a biochemist, you're not going to 
have a lot of understanding here. I have diagrams coming. Just bear with me, okay? Normal mitochondria make majority of their ATP through the oxidative phosphorylation pathways. Cancer cells do not. You can see this by these graphs as, as malignancy goes on. So the Warburg effect. I'm going to use text to start these conversations about what Warburg effect is, and then we'll use pictures. So, so aerobic glycolysis, a key metabolic feature of the Warburg phenotype or Warburg metabolism, is caused by the active metabolic reprogramming required to support sustained cancer proliferation, aka division and growth, and malignant progression. This metabolic switch is directed by altered growth factor signaling, hypoxic or normoxic activation of HIF-1-alpha, we'll talk about these in detail, transcription, oncogene activation or loss of function of suppressor genes, and is implemented in the hostile tumor microenvironment. The quote-unquote selfish reprogramming includes overexpression of glucose transporters and key glycolytic enzymes and an accelerated glycolytic flux, which with subsequent accumulation and diversion of glycolytic intermediates for cancer biomass synthesis high-speed ATP production that meets the energy demand, and accumulation of lactate, which drives tumor progression and largely contributes to tumor acidosis, which in turn synergistically favors tumor progression and resistance to certain anti-tumor therapies and compromises anti-tumor immunity. The next paper I want to go over is talking about, again, Warburg effect. Influential research by Warburg and Corey in the 1920s ignited interest of how cancer cell energy generation is different from normal cells. They observed high glucose consumption and large amounts of lactate excretion from cancer cells compared to normal cells, which oxidized glucose using mitochondria. It was therefore assumed that cancer cells were generating energy using glycolysis rather than mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation and that the mitochondria were dysfunctional. Okay, they knew this in the 1920s. The next thing I wanna show you is the the the, the title of this abstract is is irrelevant what is really relevant in this conversation is that cancer cells possess a 20 to 30 time increased rate of glucose cellular uptake and a more than 30 time higher glycotic rate compared to normal cells this increased dependence of cancer cells in relation to extracellular glucose levels necessary to support the high rates of glycolysis makes interference with glucose cellular uptake and glycolysis an attractive cancer target. I would say that's probably the understatement of the century, an attractive anti-cancer target. It is the cancer target that should be the most important cancer target and has been completely ignored. Many people know that when you get a diagnosis of cancer, one of the tests that your oncologist will send you for is something called a PET scan. And a PET scan Essentially, what it does is it uses radio-labeled glucose molecules to find where cancer cells are hiding out. And when it spikes or there's a focus on the radiography, that will signify that there's likely increased uptake of that radioactive isotope of sugar that then signifies that there's cancer active there. And it makes total sense because if you're bringing in 20 to 30 times more glucose in a tumor than you are in normal cells, that would obviously show why a PET scan works. What's mind blowing to me is that mainstream medicine cannot reverse engineer this and say, well, if a PET scan works and it's because it's bringing in so much more glucose than their surrounding tissues, why couldn't we target this? But I'll digress. So we've used a lot of text to describe what's going on here. The next thing I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to explain this using pictures. One of the main ways that our body gets energy is through sugar metabolism or glucose metabolism. And the, the process of breaking down glucose is a complex of biochemical reactions called glycolysis. Glycolysis is just supposed to be meant under normal conditions to be the beginning. You do not get a lot of energy from this. What you do is you get substrates that can be used to make a lot more energy. So glycolysis, you have glucose that ultimately ends up in a molecule called pyruvate. The chemical structures of these for our discussions are irrelevant, but what we need to know is, is that glucose ultimately ends up in a molecule called pyruvate. And in this process of glycolysis, you have an energy investment phase where you actually have to donate the energy currency of life, ATP, to make the next level of substrates. And then those 
substrates get broken down into pyruvates, which then recollect back some more ATP. So you have an energy investment phase and you have an energy generation phase. But again, the net is only two ATP, which is very, very low amount of energy. I put this in here just because it, it just highlights the different steps. You go from glucose all the way to pyruvate. You have several enzymatic, en enzymatic steps. In fact, you have 10 enzymatic steps. I don't think that this is going to be very helpful for us right now, to be frank. But when we start talking about metabolic therapy, this will become increasingly important because we're going to see that some of the medications, supplements, nutrients are going to be blocking these glycolytic enzymes at various steps, which helps kill off or starve off the cancer from the pyruvate they need. So just keep that in mind. We'll talk, we'll, th th these are, these are concepts that we're going to be going over and over and over again, because it's incredibly important. Now that we're talking about a metabolic theory of cancer versus genetic theory of cancer, this makes a lot more sense of why we would want to go back to these pathways. This is a slide that is it's kind of like the overview of human metabolism. Let's do some landmarks. So this gray box is representing the mitochondria. It's nowhere near the size, but just it's just going to have to help us understand that this is the mitochondria, this gray box here. Outside of this gray box is considered the cytoplasm, and, and glucose and glycolysis happen in the cytoplasm, so or the cytosol. So glucose is converted to pyruvate. Pyruvate is then shuttled into the mitochondria where it takes place in the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle then donates its substrates to the electron transport chain where we actually make ATP. This is the way it's supposed to happen. Glucose and or fat uh, going into pyruvate, uh, acetyl-CoA, Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, ATP. That's the way it's supposed to work. However, as we've been talking about is that sugar does not use the Krebs cycle uh, efficiently and does not use uh, oxidative phosphorylation like it's supposed to. So the majority of the ATP is made via this right here, glycolysis. And instead of pyruvate being converted into acetyl-CoA and going into the Krebs cycle, what's actually happening is it's pyruvate's being converted into lactate via this LDH, lactate dehydrogenase enzyme. And then we create this acidic microenvironment again for another time. This is another picture. So a normal cell is going to use glucose. It's going to, you know, through the 10 enzymatic steps, create pyruvate. Pyruvate is going to go into t the TCA or tri carboxylic acid cycle or the Krebs cycle um, or the citric acid cycle, whichever one you want to call it. And that's going to go to the oxidative phosphorylation pathways through the inner mitochondrial membrane. And then you're going to make ATP. That ATP is actually going to feed back onto glycolysis to say, we don't need to uh, metabolize glucose anymore. But again, that this is, this is a normal cell. Just to be clear, the thickness of the lines is showing that this is not happening as much. However, in a cancer cell, we have the exact opposite. We're not using the TCA and the Oxfos system. We're using almost exclusively glucose and glutamine. And we're going to basically uh, fuel the cell with a very inefficient pathway by just making more of it, by using more of it. And that's going to convert to uh, lactate mostly. And that's going to create the acidic environment, which is important for evasion of immune system and kind of a self-fulfilling snowball prophecy because that starts to upregulate HIF and HIF we'll talk about at length as well. But um, this is this is, this is is the Warburg metabolism without looking at complex uh, biochemical pathways. This is ultimately a normal cell, how it runs, and then how a cancer cell runs. Um, next, we're going to go into looking at the blown up 20,000 foot view of, of the Warburg effect. So we're using the Warburg effect, aerobic glycolysis, and that's producing the NADH, uh, reducing equivalence necessary. It's going to help with provision of carbons and biosynthetic pathway through the probably the, the pentose phosphate pathway, rapid generation, but not very much generation of ATP. And then of course we have lactate. And then what's driving that? In this graph, it, it, it talks about HIF1 alpha activation of oncogenes. A lot of the oncogenes actually will, will perpetuate this cycle, a mutation of tumor suppressor genes and growth factors will all be kind of contributing to this. This is a very, I would say this is a pretty conventional way of looking at the Warburg effect, how it's created, because it's still going back to mutation of genes and oncogenes and so on and so forth, upregulation of HIF. But I do I do believe that there is a lot of value in looking at it from, from this. It's just that th there's, there's ways that the Warburg effect is propagated outside of these things here. This is another picture of the Warburg effect kind of in action here. This is the cell plasma membrane. This is glucose transporter. This is a pyruvate transporter and a lactate transporter. And so glucose is massively being uptaked. It's being converted to glucose 6-phosphate. It's going through substrate level phosphorylation to make pyruvate and then ultimately lactate. Glucose is being transported to the PPP or the pentose phosphate pathway to make the backbones of the DNA necessary for the replication of, of cancer cells. And then very little, very, very little is getting into the TCA cycle. Glutamine, however, will pick up the slack and glutamine is used to for the nitrogen back 
backbones, as well as to produce citrate. And citrate is going to be used to make fatty acid synthesis. So this is kind of the cancer Warburg effect, cancer metabolism in a nutshell, looking at it from a picture standpoint. So I know that's a lot, especially if you don't have a strong science, uh, biology, cell biology, biochemistry background. I know this is a lot, but this is a huge paradigm shift in the way looking at, at cancer. As you can see in here, we're not looking at genes at all. There's no, there's no genes we're looking at here. We're not looking at genes here. There are gene products here that we're looking at, but in general, we're looking at pure metabolism and, and in terms of a strategy of how to attack cancer or to starve cancer, we're going to be looking at cutting off its major fuel sources. So we're not going to cut to the chase yet, but we're going to be talking about strategies of how we can cut off glucose supply and glutamine supply. And that's easier said than done, but there is a strategy that Dr. Seafried and others have, have put together called the press pulse protocols. And we'll get to that way later. But right now we're talking about the general overview of cancer bioenergetics and metabolism that are going to be not only hallmarks of cancer metabolism, but also the Achilles heel to cancer. And we're going to show that in great detail in the future. So I hope you like this video and until next time.